So it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. So we are back to studying on our series, The Church. And what is the church? When we look at the world we live in, it's hard to distinguish anymore between the church and the world because so many churches look exactly like the world. But what is the church? The church was never meant to be a part of the world. But they are in the world. And we go back to the words of Jesus Christ. You are in this world, but we are not to be of this world. And from the very beginning, we see that God is looking for a called out people. Then we start looking at the formation of the church. And who is the chief cornerstone? Jesus Christ. Who are the foundational blocks? I just said the apostles. Yep, the apostles and the prophets. Then who comes on top of the foundation? We do. The Bible describes us as living stones. And as these living stones spill and they grow, you get the makeup of the church. Now, as a building is built, how many buildings do you see are just completely all blocked? No windows, no doors, they're just blocks. You don't see any building like that because there'd be no way in and no way out. But rather a building has features. It has windows. It has doors. Well, Jesus Christ gave features to the church. He gave us gifts. He gave us insight. He gave us people to lead us and to guide us and to direct us. We looked at the office of apostle. We looked at the office of prophet. We looked at evangelists. And now today we are going to look at that of the office of the pastor. Now when we look at the office of the pastor, it's interesting. Because would someone please read Ephesians 4 and verse 11. He gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. And he gave some apostles, semicolons. And some prophets, semicolon. Some evangelists, semicolon and some pastors and teachers, and then the semicolon. So what's interesting about the office of pastor to begin with is it's not coupled with the office of a teacher, but the pastor is also supposed to be a teacher. He's supposed to be an instructor and a guide, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But that's interesting to know that it's not just being a pastor, that we think of maybe being a caretaker or a shepherd, but he's also a teacher. And then, of course, 1 Corinthians 12 and 28. And God has set some in the church. First, apostles. Secondarily, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. Teachers being, in this verse, all office to itself. After that, miracles, then gives a healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. When we look at that title of pastor, it appears in nine verses of the Bible, and they're listed right there. Uh, someone want to go ahead and read Jeremiah 2 and verse 8. Jeremiah 2 and verse 8. So, so we keep those straight. The office of a teacher. 
the person who has the calling of a teacher and the office of a teacher does not have to be a pastor. But if they are a pastor and they have that calling, then they are to be a teacher. The office of pastor and that of being a teacher go hand in hand. They are not separate. So where does the gift of pastor or the calling of pastor fall within um, the rank? We have to come back to the Bible. What does the Bible say? Does the Bible state where the office of the pastor falls? We know it states where the office of apostle falls, and that is the highest calling because it said, first he gave apostles. And what's the second office? Prophets. Are there any other mentioned after that? Third, and thirdly, he gave this. And fourthly, he gave this. We have thirdly teachers, but after that, it just falls off. So when it comes to where does the office of pastor or the calling of pastor fall within the ranking, the only thing we can say is scripture is silent on it. And we have to come back once again to the fact of the matter of what Paul wrote concerning the body. The hand is not greater than the foot. The foot is not greater than the hand. Yes, there might be all higher callings, but regardless of your calling, it is your responsibility to do everything you can to perfect that calling in your life and the gifts and the talents that come with that calling. We should not look at brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so and say, you know what, they have the office of a prophet or they have the office of an apostle. I wish I had that. You know, there is nothing wrong with desiring offices and talents and gifts in the right capacity. Not out of jealousy or because we think we're inferior. But what's the purpose of the gifts of the talents and the callings in the first place? To edit the He's a shepherd, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Absolutely. But when it comes to the callings, when it comes to the gifts, when it comes to the talents, they're all for the edification of the saints, for the work of the ministry, to the glorification of Jesus Christ. When is it okay to desire an extra calling or another gift or another talent? When no one else is doing the work. You know, what did Jesus Christ say concerning uh, just people being called in general. Many are called, but few are chosen. He said, pray that they would send forth laborers. What does that tell us? That tells us that there is a great work to do, but there's not people stepping up the way they're supposed to be. Why does one person end up doing the same, uh, doing multiple, multiple tasks in, throughout a church? Whether it's caretaking, taking care of the property, cutting grass, cleaning, um, doing this, doing that. Because no one else is willing to step up. So they basically say the words of Isaiah, Lord, here am I, use me. So God, give me the talents, give me the gifts to do this. If no one's going door to door and telling people about Christ, which that is our great commission to begin with, Lord, give me the words, give me the wisdom, give me the talent to do it. So when we are looking at that of uh, the office of the pastor, we find that it's coupled with that of a teacher. So what is the mission of the pastor teacher? What do you think are some of the missions of the pastor teacher? To seek God. Very good. And where would we find that model? Right there. Right there. Yes, right on the table. But how about Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 21? Jeremiah 10, 21. The passage may come rooted and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper, and all the flocks shall be scattered. 
they have the pastors there did not seek the Lord, or the leaders did not seek the Lord. What's the uttermost goal of the pastor, or probably one of the primary duties of the pastor? It should be to seek God, because what's he doing to the sheep? If he has a staff in hand, and he's walking, he's, he's leading them. And if he's not seeking God, whose direction is he going off? The primary responsibility, I would say, of the pastor is to seek God. Because if they don't know God's voice, then they're not a God in the first place. Because Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Second of all, maybe they're trying to do things in the flesh. But if they're doing things in the flesh, they're not seeking God, and they're following after their own devices. So the primary responsibility of the shepherd or the pastor is to seek God, to know God's voice, to know God's direction. Because really, when it comes down to it, what's the big B word that a pastor needs to have? Not all of ours in here is 2020. A vision. A vision. And what does the Bible say about a people with no vision? That where there is no vision, the people perish. Also, if there is no vision, then what's the direction you're going in? What's the goal? What are we pushing for? What is our purpose? Because if there is no vision, not only do the people perish, but did you ever see the old painting of the blind leading the blind? One man has his hand on the other shoulder. There's a building in the background, I can't remember what it's been. There's a stone wall, if I remember correctly. And the first guy, he's leading the other three guys right into the ditch. Where there is no vision, the people perish. So the pastor is to seek God. He needs to get a vision of what God has for that church. There are aspects that we of the vision that the pastor could have that should be a no-brainer. What's one of the first visions that the pastor should have? Souls. Souls. The whole purpose that Jesus came was not to build a church. It wasn't to build a grand cathedral. It wasn't to even build an empire close to what the Catholics have. But it was to seek and to save that which is lost. What did Jesus tell us as Christians? One of the first things he told us, it wasn't necessarily go out and sit there and wait. But before he told the disciples to go and tear in Jerusalem, he gave them the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. He didn't say go over there and get fat and build yourself up. Don't go over there and do this or that or twiddle your thumbs but to go into all the world and preach the gospel. There are aspects of the pastoral ministry that are basically a no-brainer when it comes to the vision. Seek as many souls as you can. Try to save as many souls as you can. If we go back to the book of Proverbs, we have the command that, or the statement that he that wins souls is wise. So that should be a no-brainer in itself. But God can have a specific purpose for that church in that community. What is the purpose of that church in that community? Maybe God wants them to build a youth center. Maybe God wants them to uh, do this or do that or do a different type of outreach. You know, we can try and seek and save souls as much as we can. And when I say soul, save souls, we know it's the Holy Ghost that does the work. We lead him there. But still, maybe we want to go to this area of town and if we Oh, the pastor would be in tune with um, the Holy Ghost. God would say, don't even bother with that town because they are already right set in their ways. They're not ready right now. Go to this area. We've already seen that in Scripture. Paul desired to go to a certain place, and then he saw the vision of the Macedonian man. And the Holy Ghost said, no, don't go there. I need you to go over here. We've seen it in Scripture when Jesus went to the land of the Gazarenes, probably one of the most famous um, demon possession, possession accounts that we're aware of in the Bible. Legion. 
Why didn't God, Jesus stay in the land of the Gadarenes and try to save souls? Why did he stay over there and minister? Because he went over there for one man, and then he came all the way back and set sail. And why well, should he say he set sail? If I remember correctly, Jesus walked on the water until he got to the boat during that account. So why didn't Jesus go into the land of the Gadarenes? Because if he studied out during this time, they didn't want anything to do with Jesus. They would accept it. It was a land full of witchcraft, demon worship. There's something interesting with the land of the gathering that I think is interesting with the upcoming generation. I don't want to wait for the upcoming generation, but realistically, we are living in a time and frame where we're seeing a transition. We're seeing those people that were raised in church their entire life come to church, but we're living standing in the gap where there are people that come to Christ, but we're also dealing with a generation that don't know Christ. And you know what's going to make a, a huge, huge impact in the millennials? You get a whole group of people that never gone to church before, and one of them really get a hold of the real deal. And they take it, and they tell them, and they show, and all of a sudden, someone else gets saved. You know what? This is nothing like we've ever had before. That's exactly what's going on in the land of Gadarenes. Jesus couldn't minister there, but he got to that one person, and they realized what a difference that Jesus made in this one person. And it was nothing like the other people. Having the vision is part of the pastor's mission. Seeking the lost is part of of the pastor's uh, uh, mission as well. Then we get down to probably the most common one that we know because it happens every single Sunday morning, every single Sunday night, and on a Tuesday night. Would someone please read Jeremiah 3.15 and I'll read Ephesians 1. So the pastor shall do what? Feed them with knowledge and understanding. Ephesians 1, 17 through 20, and 17, verses 17 and 18 are what you should pray if you want to be a visionary. But 17 through 20, that the Lord, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being light, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the seeding greatness of his power to us for who believe according to the work of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set it at his own right hand in the heavenly places. So the next thing... The, uh, that the mission of the pastor should be is to feed the sheep, but not just to feed them with anything. If you go to a lot of churches on Super Bowl Sunday night, what are the shepherds going to be, pastors going to be feeding their sheep with? A whole lot of nonsense. A whole lot of worldly, secular commercials that shouldn't even be in the church in the first place. Feeding them with entertainment, the football game. But what are they supposed to be feeding the sheep with? Knowledge and understanding. Not entertainment. We don't come to church to be entertained. That is not the point. The pastor is supposed to feed the sheep with good things, with nourishing things. Do you let your children sit down and eat junk food all day? Do you let them just hang out on soda all day and not ever eat anything nutritious? Do you feed them all those empty calories? Do you let them just sit in front of the TV or the computer or whatever it is and just do whatever they want all day long? Realistically, that's not helpful. And maybe you can remember growing up and maybe you had a TV. What would your parents say if you sat there and watched it all day long? 
Go outside and do something. Your mind's going to turn to mush. If you just feed them junk food all day, are they going to grow the way that they're supposed to? Are they going to mature the way they're supposed to? Probably not because we all need those nutrition, we all need those vitamins, we need the right proper things to grow. The same thing is true with our spiritual lives. We cannot feed ourselves worldly things and expect to grow in the things of God. We cannot expect to listen to secular music and expect our mind to be constantly thinking on the good things of God. We cannot watch things that we shouldn't be watching in the first place and expect those images to not hinder our walk with God. What we put in eventually comes out. Same thing is true with the pastor. What you feed your sheep is what you're going to get out of your sheep. They are to train us with wisdom and understanding. The two go hand in hand, uh, knowledge and understanding. And if we replace that word with any word understanding with any other word, I would say wisdom. Because knowledge and wisdom go hand in hand. You can know about something, but if you don't know how to apply it, it's useless. And if you may know how to apply something, but you don't know where the starting point is on how to get it, wisdom is useless. Wisdom and knowledge goes hand in hand. The mission of the pastor, part of his uh, pastoral duties, is to provide understanding of knowledge, but also understanding. And let me throw this one in there as well, because this goes in with it, even though it didn't apply with, uh, didn't appear in these verses. Where do the sheep really get understanding and wisdom? Is it during the sermon? It's not always during the sermon. Because if you're at home reading the Bible in your own personal life and seeking God about something, the revelation may not come when you're reading the Word of God. But where it becomes real in your life is at the altar in prayer. That's where wisdom and knowledge come. The past. The teacher can do everything they can to give you the wisdom and to give you the understanding and the knowledge about something. But let's face it, sometimes things just don't play. And they can do everything they can. They can give us a million illustrations, because an illustration is nothing but a window into that message, kind of like Jesus did with the parable, is to kind of give insight, is to bring that heavenly meaning down and place it into an earthly meaning to try to help us understand it. But it does not always click. Sometimes people can explain it in the simplest form, and we still look at them like, huh? What are you talking about, Willis? I don't know what you're meaning. But when we sit down and we pray about it, the Holy Ghost comes by and just like that. Oh, it's like a light bulb goes off. So the mission of the pastor is to provide knowledge and understanding to the sheep. And that is what he's to feed them. Also, he's just to feed them in general. Do you still have Jeremiah 23, Mom, or in the vicinity? Can you read verse 4, please? Yep. 20, uh, chapter 23 and verse 4. So the mission of the shepherd is to feed the sheep knowledge and understanding. But we may even throw in there to direct them in the ways of God, to provide spiritual insight. But with Jeremiah 23 and 4, the mission of the pastor is just to feed the sheep in general. He mentioned about <laughs> calming their fears. How can the pastor feed a sheep in general? To provide encouragement, to provide scripture verses. There was a gentleman that comes into work from time to time, and he was telling me, I don't know why God let me go through this, but I just say, thank you, Jesus, and help me to understand why. And then as he was getting ready to leave, he goes, you 
know, I have trouble with anxiety. I don't know why God let me go through this, but I am trusting that he's going to tell me why at some point or something to that effect. But as Christians, a light bulb should go off and recognize and say, you know what? That's not my God. My God doesn't give his children anxiety. Because at that point we recognize that there's another individual out there that likes to provide fear and anxiety. How do we know that? Because God has not given us a spirit of what? Fear. Fear doesn't come from God. But of power and of love and of sound mind. Well, sometimes we go through that. And sometimes we just need the pastor to come by and say, you know what? God's with you in the middle of it. You know, re maybe reflect on some of these verses, maybe we'll expound some on you, give you some guidance. That's what I refer to as feeding the sheep in general. Or maybe you have some fear that I don't know how God's got to pay my, how I'm going to do this, or how God's going to provide. Or maybe you're going through a rough time with something else, or who knows, it could be a plethora of things that come on, because we all know that life is full of quote-unquote adventures, if you want to call it. Sometimes it just seems like things just don't stop. And it's not always the same type of thing. But how does the pastor feed the sheep in general? He's the one that come by, comes by and gives you guidance, counseling, in those times of need. We see that even with the good shepherd. He never left the sheep. But he always made sure that they were on the path, that they were where they needed to be. And that is the mission of the pastor. If we go down a little bit farther, oh, like I said, already mentioned it, kind of in passing, but the pastoral, the pastor as a shepherd can see, be seen reflected in Psalm 23. And we can go through down there and see oh, just thing after thing after thing of how it relates to not just Jesus Christ, what he does in our life, but as how it relates to the office of the pastor in general. In Psalm 23, and if you want to turn there, you can. You don't have to. I'm sure most of us are familiar with that anyhow. But as we near the end of uh, the chapter, there's a phrase that pops out. Thou anointest my head with oil. When we look at oil throughout the Word of God, we find that most times when we talk about the anointing oil, uh, oil is an anointing, but when it's not an anointing, we're typically talking about oil as a healing agent. We think of the ball of Gilead, how you apply it to your wounds, and it heals. Well, while that is the role of the shepherd, if he finds any wounds on the sheep, he will pull, apply that oil to the sheep for a healing purpose. But, that's not why he anoints the head with oil. See, when you're looking at sheep, there's lots of pests that come along with it. If you've ever seen any animals in the field, cow, sheep, whatever it was, there's probably things flying around them. Gnats, flies, insects. Well, oil was not just a healing agent, but the shepherd would anoint the head with oil because it also served as a bug repellent. So when we look at the mission of the pastor, he anoints the sheep, their heads with oil because it puts kind of a hedge of protection around the battle to some degree. The prayers kind of keep the attack of the enemy away to some degree, or maybe even hinder it. Maybe the little things that would come in, it, he will help guide them from and keep them from. You know that God places a guard around his people. He really does. One of the most famous passages, what do we like to quote when the enemy is just constantly on us and he's pounding us into the ground? When the enemy comes in like a flood, the fear of the Lord raises up a standard. Good job. That's exactly right. When the enemy comes in like a flood, when it seems like we're going through a trial, the Bible doesn't say that we won't go through trials. In fact, it says, yeah, the complete opposite. It says, you'll have trials and tribulations. You'll have times of discomfort. 
but when the enemy comes in like a flood, which is, I think, when it seems overbearing, when it seems like he's just going to overtake you, what is a flood? It's a mighty flow of water that seems to be unescapable. You can't get away from it. But then that's when the Holy Ghost steps in and says, you know what? I'm here with you. And he puts that up, that wall of protection. Not that you weren't going through anything before, but now when it's at the point where it seems like it's going to be overbearing, that's going to overtake you, God steps and says, that, no, it's not. What does Saul state concerning the angels of the Lord? They encamp around those that fear them. But he, they don't just encamp around them, but what else do they do? They deliver them. So God is constantly there. He anoints our head with oil to try to keep the past away and to keep them off our tail for a little bit. That we may experience some relief. Does that mean that that oil keeps all the bugs away? Probably not. But it probably limits the number. When do trials and tribulations overtake us? It's not just Typically, that one trial, unless it's grown and grown and grown. But typically, it seems like this trial, this thing's happening, and this thing's happening, and that thing's happening, and Brother Eli's pressing my last nerve, and it's all just building and building and building. That's what it seems like is going to overtake us. But God will raise up a standard. And the shepherd, he leads his sheep through the valley of death. Typically, when a shepherd goes through a mountainous path, it'll be stony. It may get cramped and small. The sheep may have to go one by one. There may be even a small section taken out of the ground that they have to jump over. But you realize that shepherd will go in front of the sheep. What does that do for the sheep? It shows them that if he can do it, I can do it. The shepherd has gone before me to make sure that the way is the least treacherous as possible. Is that not what Jesus has done for the church? Is that not what the shepherd is supposed to do for the sheep? Because realistically, realistically, the shepherd should be able to blaze the trail. The pastor should be able to blaze the trail, even when it seems that times are up or rough. The great shepherd has already gone before him. But you know, we are if when it comes to the true church, it just seems like nobody is really serving God the way they're supposed to. Everybody's trying to build their church, and I do mean their church, and they're using gimmicks, and they're using this. And they're trying to use the things of the world. But when it comes to the true pastor, the way is truly narrow. But he keeps pressing on. And since he keeps pressing on, the sheep are to keep pressing on. What did the apostle Paul write? He said, bro, that as I follow Christ, Followed me. It's not that Paul was the ultimate example, but what Paul was saying is, you know what? In this Christian walk, if no one else is willing to go before, him, I will follow Jesus Christ, and because of that, I will blaze away, follow in my footsteps, that we may all reach heaven one day. Not because of who I am, but it is Christ that liveth within me. And we have to keep in mind when it comes to the valley. What kind of valley is it? According to Psalm 23, a shadow of, does it say that it's the valley of death? No. It is a shadow of the valley of death. That's not where you're meant to die. It may look grim, it may look like it's full of despair. It may even look hopeless. But just keep in mind, it's a shadow. When a shadow touches you, do you get hurt? Do you get bruised? 
No. The only thing that might happen with a shadow is you might get discouraged. You may play on your emotions. It may play on your fears. But physically, you're fine. When it comes to terrorists, how do terrorists really work? If we get down to it, what do terrorists strive for? When it comes to Islam, anyone else who might be considered a terrorist, what do they dwell on? They thrive on fear. And the media would just refuse to air anything. We wouldn't know anything. Ignorance sometimes truly is bliss. But that's what the terrorists look for. They look for somebody to show their terror to strike fear. They don't necessarily hurt anybody with it. They're meant out to scare somebody. Or if they do hurt people with it, they may hurt maybe one, two, several hundred. But by airing it for everybody to see, they're reaching a much larger audience. They may not hurt them physically, but they're striking fear. They're striking, throwing out word. That is the shadow of the valley of death. The devil thrives on our fear. He thrives on our anxiety. He thrives on our anger. He may not hurt us physically, but he thrives on all this stuff. And it's the pastor who is the one who leads us through the valley of a shadow of death. Once again, coming back. This Christian life is not the Shirley Temple experience. What do I mean by that? Shirley Temple came out at a time when the Great Depression was out. And why did everybody flock to her? Why did everybody love her? Because in a time when things were going bad and horrible for them in life, when they went to the movies and they watched Shirley Temple on the big screen for maybe about an hour or two, they could experience laughter. They could experience hope. They could experience joy. Not that I'm promoting Shirley Temple. I'm just talking about the concept of what made her so big. They were going through a horrible, horrible time. Life is not always roses and flowers and great old times. In fact, sadly, a lot of times, it might even be the opposite. But... We must remember, this Christian walk is just a short time. We talk about that gap between birth and death, that line, how it's just a short span to eternity. The older that one gets, the more we realize just how short that dash is. It seems like just yesterday we were in high school, and now all of a sudden we look in the mirror and we may not even recognize that person. We feel the same all the way, um, the way we did, excuse me, perhaps we feel the same way we did when we were 15 or 18. Not physically, but on the inside. On the inside. But we look in the mirror and our body does not reflect the way that we feel on the inside. We think that we can go out and we can do this, I was talking to a gentleman who was telling me about age. And he was telling me that when he was, I think he was 36, somewhere around there, maybe even 40. Somewhere in that gap. He said he was out playing football with his boys. And he said, if the football was tossed, and he knew that he could dive and catch it. And he said, when he knew he should still be in the air, he couldn't realize why he was feeling himself hit the ground. Because what he thought he could do mentally, he knew he used to be able to do, he could no longer do. And he goes, that for the first time in his life, he had to go to the, whether it was the doctors or the emergency room, and for the first time in his life, he got his first fracture. He said before that, he never broke a bone or anything. But all because he felt like he could dive and catch the ball because he did it before. And he knew he should be able to. But reality sank in, and he couldn't. That little dash seemed like it was catching up with him. No, we go through the valley of the shadow of death, but life 
is truly but a vapor. You blink, and you're thinking, what did I do with my entire life? What I did wasn't worth anything. Did I do things of substance and value? Or we look at the back of those trials and those tribulations we went through, and maybe we are facing the end of our life, and it, you know what? Why did I struggle with that for so long? You know, here I am facing eternity. You know, it is just a shadow. Yes, things get hard, things get tough, but the pastor should be there to help us through those times, to give us guidance, direction, and encouragement. There's a whole lot more on that paper. We'll probably finish it up next week. But when we're looking at the office of the pastor, it is a reflection of Psalm 23 and the Good Shepherd. But we also need to remember in Ephesians 4.11 that he doesn't just guide us, but he is the pastor, but he is also supposed to be a teacher to give the sheep guidance, direction, wisdom, and understanding. Any thoughts, any questions so far at this point in time? If not, let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke any attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset, one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move as he so desires, Lord. Anoint our hearts and our minds to, re to receive the word which you have for us today, Lord, that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives, Lord, that we would be in one mindset and one accord, Lord, with each other, that you may move however you so desire, Lord. Anoint the song leader and the musicians as they praise you upon the strength of instruments, upon the, as they lead us in the songs you have us to sing, Lord. Anoint the pastor's mind and his lips as they bring forth your word and give him a special blessing today as well. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.